Bruins are in, but Gonzalo Higuain is out. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the latest edition of Miami Total Football Radio, or like I say in Spanish, Radio. Uh, I'm your host, Franco Penizo, joined as always by, well, by now it's always, uh, Steve Brenner. Steve, how are you doing this week? How's your Pez campaign mode going? How's the video game going? Has your wife caught on to you sneak playing yet? Franco, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> top secret. Yeah, no, um, ticking along, but just it's just been um, it's it's been busy, you know, doing other things. But uh, you know, as we're going to talk about, just excited to have the fans come back in or come in for the first time. You know, it's killed me going to the matches and just seeing them. You know, some of the fans just gathering the corners outside. So to have them back in is is great news. Yeah, so we have that to talk about. We've got a couple of games to recap and review. We won't necessarily go into it in depth because the games have happened uh, about a week now. At least one of them happened at least a, a week now at this point. So we're going to get talk about that. We're going to talk about Iguain's Gonzalo Iguain's red card and a few more other topics that I think are interesting and worth mentioning. So before we get into all that, just have to remind everyone to please give us a follow on all our social media accounts at Miami Total Football on YouTube and Facebook, at MIA Total Football on Twitter, and at Miami underscore Total underscore fo- Football on Instagram. So every follow we get, of course, helps us to continue to produce this content for you on a weekly and regular basis. So with that, we've got a lot to talk about. So Steve, let's get to it. All right, Steve, so as we mentioned, the fans are in. This will be the first game this Saturday against Orlando City that I dub the Sunshine Clásico, El Clásico del Sol. That's just what I call it. I don't know what your name for it is, Steve. I don't know if you have a a Derby in there or a Florida Derby or what you call it, but that's that's what I've called it with Eric since we've been on this pod and, and running the pod, so... Next, this next edition of the Sunshine Classico will have Inter Miami fans in the stadium for the first time. Tickets were opened or, or were sold as of tonight, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. to only and exclusively season ticket members. For each season ticket that and that somebody has, they can buy up to four tickets per that member or per that season ticket holder. So, let's say if there's two of you that have season tickets, you could buy up to eight based on. The rules that I that I read and that I saw today. Uh, regardless, there will be a couple of thousand fans in the stands on Saturday. This will be the first time that happens for Inter Miami. With a caveat, there were 400 or so supporters from the supporters groups at the last game at Inter Miami CF Stadium. Steve, what do you make of this news? What do you think it'll be like in the venue on Saturday afternoon? And how do, much do you think it'll help Inter Miami as they take on Orlando City and try to make this push towards the playoffs? First, first up, you know, in terms of atmosphere and just being at the game, it's going to be so much better. You know, we've been there all season, haven't we? Pretty much into the the brand new stadium, no fans. You know, and it was just it's just sort of drains of the soul, really, just to think that you know it, it usually be so much different. We've both been in stadiums, 60, 70, 80 thousand, you know, World Cups, whatever. And, you know, to have to go to these games and not have anyone there has just been so cruel. So, um, A, to have people back, hopefully about, th- you know, 3,000 maybe. Um, you know, I sat outside just in the stands for a little bit during the um, Atlanta game. And it was just so much better, even though there's like 400 people there. Just the atmosphere and, you know, Jorge Mass and the ownership members have been sort of just sat near us in the press box. And they always make a noise. Um, but to have like proper fans in the, in the stands was just awesome. And um I don't know, you know, you look, there's been the conversation in England, like about the Premier League, that there's been a load of crazy games. And, you know, that that's it's because there hasn't been any fans there and the players feel under less pressure and start and start taking a chance. Whereas they know that if there's 60,000 people on their back and they make a mistake, they're going to get, you know, booed and heckled or whatever. But I think maybe with, with Inter Miami, maybe there's been a situation where they've needed the crowd just to sort of push them on and, and get them on a bit and, you know, pick them up when they've been sort of struggling or, you know, whatever. So maybe on the, from the flip side, it will, you know, it will, it will help them. And I definitely think it's going to be a good occasion. Look, it's, you know, it's not going to be packed. It's probably going to be around quarter full, but, um, you know, long, long overdue. And, you know, I'm pleased, I'm pleased for all the fans that have sort of stuck by the, the club and team for so long, you know, waiting to properly support the team. And then, then, you know, to have that taken away from them has been, you know, unfair or, or cruel but a symptom at the time right now so um it's going to be interesting for sure yeah so I, I mean we don't have an exact number of how many fans will be in or how many tickets have been released the club hasn't released that they, you know they're, they're saying they will announce the attendance figure on saturday during the match or towards the end of the match as as teams normally do 
I would guess that it's anywhere between two to five, six thousand tops. You know, maybe, definitely, maybe definitely. a quarter or a third of the stadium at best. Obviously, there's social distancing measures in place, and fans do have to be responsible and wear masks at all times unless they're eating or drinking. I mean, those are what the rules say. Now, how how that's enforced on Saturday, we'll we'll see. But like you said, it should make for a great atmosphere. It should make for a nice environment, especially. You know, just from us as uh, as neutrals, as as observers of the game, it's going to be nice. But especially for the team and the players and the coaching staff that put in the work every single day and have not been able to play a game in front of the supporters that root them on and will cheer them on. I'm curious to see how many people turn out. Obviously, Inter Miami has not been very good this season, and obviously the buzz that existed back in week two, or we were heading towards week three. Back in in March, when the buzz was at an all-time high, obviously that buzz has dipped a good bit, and interest in the team has not has has decreased, right? Because you know David Beckham's not around anymore, or making that making the appearances, and there's the, the team hasn't been able to win very much. So I'm curious to see how much interest there is. Obviously, I, I fully expect the diehards to uh, supporters to be out there in attendance and, and making their presence felt, which will make for a good atmosphere nonetheless. But I'm curious to see. How many how many fans are out there? What do you think? Do you think we'll see a good few thousand, or do you think it'll be uh, maybe a, just one or two on the on the lower scale? Because you always always also have to take into account the the factor of coronavirus and people maybe being a little shy or a little tentative to to go out and, and maybe go somewhere where there's going to be a larger amount of people than, than we've seen together in, in a while. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that wh- however many tickets they make available, I'm sure that they'll they'll sell them. You know, we've both spoken and spent time with on the phone or whatever in person with, with some of the fans groups. And we you know how sort of lively they were getting before the start of the season. So remember, we were both in L.A. and there was, you know, this decent sort of traveling number, wasn't there, that flew over from Miami with us. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think it, you know, everything's going to be taken up you know, regardless, really. And I also wonder whether or not how many Orlando f- fans will sort of make the journey. The South Florida Derby, it's Florida Turnpike, the Turnpike Derby. I think that's, that's quite nice. That's what you like? You like that? You like that? I like, I like listen, man, I like, and I, I know some people disagree uh, strongly on Twitter, but look, I like Sunshine Classico. It's, it's, and, and, and me and, and, no, and, and, me and played me, like three times. How could it be a Classico? But, no, but, but Classico, classico, but, classico, but, classico, but, classico only means rivalry. Like that's all it means. Like I, I know the literal translation because you know you see the word classical and you think classic yeah. and it's gonna be like, but that's not classical. Just means rivalry in Spanish. It's just the word for derby. Um, so it's you know it, like Peru versus Chile is el clásico del Pacífico, like you know sure. the Pacific Classic. It's you know it's just a rivalry. Does, does it mean that Peru Chile are play you the best games in the world? Or but you know it's just it's just the word for rivalry. So I mean sure. for me, I think I think it's a name that fits. It's something that can be translated to English and Spanish. Um, obviously, you have a very Latin, po- high Latin population in South Florida, so you probably want to do something that appeals to both English and Spanish. I think it fits. I don't know. We'll see, we'll see if it sticks. We'll see if it sticks. I, I mean, I know some people like it, but I know some people strongly dislike it. I'll tell you what I dislike. I dislike names that like like El Trafico for the LA Galaxy LA FC Derby in Los Angeles. I I I, I get. I like the, that. Uh, I thought that's. I think that's good. No I think that's, man, that's, that's I different. I did, I dislike that so much. And like I I fully agree with Bob Bradley and other people that you know are on the teams that dislike the name. It just I get that it fits the 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 characteristics of the city and but like you that's that's not a name for a rivalry. It's just it's it just it seems it seems it seems silly. It just seems it just seems silly. It seems like like it's it's a joke like it's a play thing i don't know this that doesn't doesn't appeal to me it doesn't appeal to me but um let's 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 switch gears and talk about obviously not the atmosphere but the player that will be missing uh this weekend and that is Gonzalo Higuaín i broke the news over the weekend because we, we nobody we didn't see it on the broadcast uh, after the match against the Montreal Impact which Inter Miami lost 2 to 1 but Gonzalo Higuaín was sent off after the final whistle for I guess having too many choice words for the head referee. He was sent off, and he will miss this weekend's match against Orlando City. How big of a loss is this, Steve? How much does Inter Miami lose not having him on the field? And what do you make of his red card? What do you think about what transpired and and what happened uh, against the impact? Well, no, I mean, look, they're going to miss him big time. I, I was really impressed with him on against Atlanta. I know he didn't score, but I, you know, he he was dropping deep. He's clearly, a, you know, a great player. Um, and, and definitely sort of I think 
no with no disrespect to MLS, you know, a player of his of his quality should sort of should stand out. But he's been sort of, he was trying to boss the game, you know, against Atlanta rather than I just always thought that he'd be, you know, playing on that last defender as a, as a as a striker. He was really dropping deep and linking play. And I think um you know he 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 showed a great range of passing as well for for, for a striker. Um but yeah, look, they're gonna miss him. And it was he's he's definitely had he's he's definitely aggressive, puts himself about, which is great, you know. There were some quotes flying about with him earlier in, early in the week, or you know, saying that he he feels like he's he's come to MLS and he can enjoy himself, the pressure in Italy, and also you know he played at Real Madrid, which is a crazy club at the best of times. But you know, the amount of media spotlight and scrutiny in Madrid and then in, in Turin with Juventus is huge. So you know, he can relax here. That's not necessarily to say that he's he's you know putting his feet up on on South Beach every day after training. He may be, but good luck to him if he is. But you know, he, 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 he's still showing on the pitch that he cares, and I think that showed, unfortunately, at the end of the you know the defeat of the other night against Montreal when he when he got sent off and he's having to go to the referee. So it was just it was frustrating, wasn't it? A frustrating performance. You know, they they never could really get going and create enough chances. He couldn't get enough chances. He was angry. He had to go at the referee and got sent off. So, you know, it's just it's just it was just one of those things. But it shows that he, he cares. I think for sure. Now. I'm going to I'm going to chime in and add what I think, but I want to hear your your opinion on this matter because now obviously Twitter is uh, a a good social media platform to be informed, but it's also also it leads to you hear more of the anger and the frustration. You hear those voices more often than you hear the the positive ones, right? So I I heard a lot of negative f- criticism and feedback from fans. I saw a lot of it some people at, you know, Messaged me about it, or sent me messages about it, or, or tweets about it, about how poorly this looks on him, and how bad this is for the team. That the team captain blew his lid and had this happen to him. He's obviously needs to lead by example, especially with the armband. You can't have him missing games, especially at this crucial juncture in the season. So, Steve, are you disappointed with the red card? Are you disappointed with his actions? You, it, is, do you would do you criticize him for it, or do you take it as just you know the, the situation happened and, and it's something that needs to be corrected going forward? But you know, it's just, it, you just no, chalk no. it up to happening. It's it's he at the moment. He was frustrated. They lost. He was angry. He had to go to the referee. You know, it happens. You know that like you say, it was it was a defeat. And it, it, and it and it would clearly have got to him. So yeah, you know, should he be leading? For example, he's a captain, sure. But you know, on the flip side, he like he's showing that he cares and he's getting, you know, stuck in. And yeah, okay, maybe he should have. He, he's old, he's experienced enough and played in big games, um, you know, to know when it when he sort of crossed the line. But you know, it, it got to him and he, and he had a go. So I don't think you can criticise him too much, really. Um, if he wasn't showing any passion or or, or upset, then you then that you could question him as well. So. Um, I think you should um, just think that, you know, he did it out of just pure frustration more than anything else. Yeah, I agree with you. I I think, you know, he should know better. Obviously, he should know better. He's a very experienced player. But I also I also don't fully blame him. Now, if this happens again and again, okay, then then that's something needs to be looked at. But as a one off in a game that was frustrating for him and for the team, they gave up another late goal. He thought that they should have had a penalty kick in the dying seconds. He's very competitive, plays with his heart on his sleeve, and his emotions are always very clear to see on the field, right? Whether he's frustrated or happy, you, you can tell his mood on the field. He, he shows that. So I won't blame, I won't criticize him too much for this one. He should know better, absolutely. This should, He should not have happened, especially at this point in the season, because if they lose this game and then don't make the playoffs by a point or by three points then you're going to say well look he he could have helped them in that regard if you know. uh, yeah but it's not they're not going to not qualify for the players because of that game is it i mean this this goes back to look at you know the, of course the, 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 but he's, he's, he's seven star whatever it was you know sure like, but you know, he's still yeah. but he's still the captain and he's still the highest paid player on the team right so there, there's I, I get the criticism that some people have i i again personally i won't I won't criticize or rip him for, for this one. Again, it happens at times, even to the most experienced players. Look at Zinedine Zidane, a headbutt in a World Cup final. So I was just it, Googling no. that right now. I'm looking at that. I'm just <laughs> about to say, do you know that Zidane headbutt the World well, Cup final? Steve, I, I'm surprised you had to Google that. Um. Well, I, I, I actually wanted to see if he was captain. I wanted to see if he was captain. 
Um, and I don't think he, I don't think he was. No, I'm, I mean, my point is that he's an very experienced player. He played at the highest level and, and internationally. He's played at the highest level at clubs, and, and he still. It was had, the World Cup final. Right. No one was watching, so you know, <laughs> it's no only estimated TV audience of seventy-eight billion people. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So I, again, it, it happens. You know, you let it be the only time it happens for him because they they need him on the field. They can't have him blowing his cool. And I, I said this, yeah. I think with you a couple of weeks ago when we were talking or maybe last week when we were talking about the armband the only way I could see him losing the armband from this point forward was if he had an episode like this where he lost his cool and got a red card or I I think I said it in those words but I don't think this will cost him the armband permanently I think it'll still be his just but he he has to keep those emotions in check at least the frustration because I, look, I, and I'll say this, I'll add this, and I'm not apologizing for Iguain, but I also think the referee, just based off his body language and based just, this is just pure observation, and I don't have any information, just my opinion, I think the referee was also trying to maybe make a point. Because his body language, when he gives him the red card, is like, well, listen, you're a big name, but look, I'm, I'm going to show you up and I'm going to send you off because I can do that and you're you're not as big as you think you are. Like that, That's how I read the way he gave him the red card because the red card doesn't come while they're, they're debating, right? Or while they're arguing or while Gonzalo Higuain's saying stuff to him, right? It happens well after as Gonzalo Higuain's getting ready to walk off the field. His back is turned to the referee. He's, he doesn't even, he's not even facing the referee in that moment. And then I guess the referee called him by his name and and Gonzalo Higuain turns around and he he sees that he got a red card. So yeah, I mean, look, it's not as if he he turned around, he put his hands on him, he was pushing him, he was in his face. He's clearly said something to him. So on the flip side, you know, the referee could easily just sort of let it pass. Look, the game's over. I know he's upset. Let's just let's just leave it. So right, but, you know, it's a fifty fifty sort of thing. He didn't have to send him off. Right. Why? But why not? Why not send him off? If, like immediately while he's while he's you know cursing him out or whatever he's saying yeah I mean, um, you know. why, why wait I, like that's that to me is was is is the bit of the head scratcher or like why wait till after the 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 argument has happened and, and Gonzalo Higuain's literally walking off the field about to head into the tunnel to then I know, say but if, if you were getting abused by Gonzalo Higuain what would what would you do how would you pull, react then, would you then, just then pull out, then pull, no. but then pull out the red card immediately why wait till like it's cooled down till the player has walked away from you to then walk towards because they argued on the far side right when they, sure. when they when they debated when they started having that 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 confrontation it was on the far side of the field immediately after the final whistle the footage has come out and you can see it on uh, miami total football's youtube page you can see it on instagram on miami total football's instagram he gonzalo Higuain is now on the near side he's literally near midfield and about to walk off the field and then the referee calls him over and he does a hand like the mouth gesture like you talk too much or you 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 were running your mouth too much and shows him the red card and and then like kind of waves him off the field like all right go ahead so i don't to me that just spoke of like a referee that was trying to make a point or make an example out of Higuain after the fact i don't think I mean, again, I don't know what Higuain said, but if it was as bad, if it was bad enough to give him a red card, then give it to him in that moment that it happens. Well, like, I don't understand the thought process behind waiting and then giving him that red card. But yeah, well, look, we don't, we don't, like you say, you know, we don't know what he said. Right. Look at what Zidane said to, uh, to Matarazzi that time. If, so, yeah. Steve, if I cursed you out and I said something bad to you, is your reaction going to come minutes later or is it going to come immediate like i i don't get the thought process behind waiting regardless of what was said i don't understand why it took him a few minutes or or some time to figure out that he's going to give gonzalo Higuain a red card like that sure. that to me of course again we don't know what it was said but if if it was that bad to give him a red card then give him a red card right away or shortly thereafter don't wait until things have cooled down and you guys are you know walking off the field but regardless that's that's all water under the bridge gonzalo Higuain will miss this game Steve, quickly, before we move on to the next topics, who do you see replacing Iguain on Saturday versus Orlando City? Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Maybe Agu- Aguadelo, do you think, maybe will, will come in? or um, That's my you know, pick. Ha- That's my pick. I think Aguadelo has been the, the number one option for much of the year up until Iguain got here. Obviously, Carranza has gotten some looks, and Robbie Robinson has gotten some looks. But I think Aguidelo is the one that's performed more consistently. He scored three goals. He has the most goals out of the the, of the other forward options. So I th- and and he I forget which game it was that he recently scored in, but um, before he got injured. So I think he'll be he'll be the the go to option. I think he's the one that 
that Diego Alonso trusts the most and, and that he'll rely on to give them something in, in that part of the field. So I think it's going to be Juan Abadella. Will he play that, that front three, though, with, with sort of Lewis Morgan and then, you know, Agudelo and then one, one other, I guess? Well, um, that's, that's the thing, because we're, we're expecting that Rodolfo Pizarro will be back this, this weekend. So does he stick with, with the 4-3-3 the three, three that he's been using, or does he go back to the 4-2-3-1, or does he go with, you know, a, a five-man or three-man back line, however you want to label it? And that, that, I think, is something that's worth talking about or, or, or thinking about because I haven't put a great deal of thought into it. We still don't know f- officially if, if Pizarro will play. That was what right. was expected when we spoke to Diego Alonso last, about a week ago, uh, about the topic. So not sure if he's a, if it's 100% sure that Rodolfo Pizarro will play. It's expected that he will, but we're not 100% sure. Pro, you know, and then you have Andres pro- Reyes. Then you have Andres Reyes, who I actually interviewed a, shortly ago, and he didn't really want to reveal whether he's ready to play or not. He said he's recovered and he's he's gotten better. Um, he he revealed, and this is you know I guess this might be the first time people hear this. He revealed he did have surgery on his face after that injury against the Philadelphia Union. I'm going to write an article. There will be more details to come on that and what he said. But he did have an operation on his face after that injury against the Philadelphia Union. Probably should expect him to wear a mask if he plays. Again, he kept that close to the vest, didn't reveal whether he would play or not this weekend. So we'll see if he, if he takes part. If he does, then I think it's you know very likely to go with a back four. But if he doesn't, then you know they might go back to a, a back five or a back three. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, it's the cre- creativity has been the problem, isn't it? They've sort of shored it up at the back. Gonzalo Perez has been great. You know, he he on the ball actually he set up didn't he that the goal for on the yeah. against Atlanta with a great pass out wide. Um, yeah. But you know, like Lewis Morgan has been the most creative player, so you've got to get him on the ball and try and get him to create because there's not much up creativity right now throughout you know in the rest of the team. So he's the guy you've got to try and get it to him, but. Do you play? Do you play? Keep him out out wide on the left, or do you play him more central? I don't know. The sort of he hasn't got a lot of options to, especially when it comes to attack, to really sort of mix it up. Yeah. So, um, oh, he, you know. he, Diego Alonso did mix it up by putting Lewis Morgan as like a shadow striker, secondary striker, at at points during that game against the Impact. Well, we'll talk about that game that lost the two to one defeat to Montreal, as well as the one to one draw against Atlanta United from a week ago. After this. Right, Steve, so there were two games since we've last been on the pod. A 2-1 defeat to the Montreal Impact this past Saturday, which we've mentioned, and a 1-1 draw at home against Atlanta United. Now, in that game against Atlanta United, Inter-Miami was the better team from the run of play, but they couldn't put the ball in the, into the back of the net until the 80th minute, three minutes after Breckshay checks into the game. He smashes home a uh, Lewis, Lewis Morgan cross at the back post. And it looks like Inter Miami's going to take three points and get a big win in their playoff push. They give up a goal three minutes later. Uh, and I think it was Jake Mulraney, if, if my memory serves me correctly, that fires home or, or taps in across from Jurgen Dam. So, Steve, what, what can we take away from these last two matches? What are the biggest talking points or the biggest things you, you, you take from these last two games? Well, yeah, the Atlanta game was such, you know, scored a great goal, hung in there, great goal, great passing move. You know, Gonzalez Perez to Lewis Morgan, great cross, break shape, brilliant. I looked down on my phone, started tweeting, looked back up and Atlanta had equalised, you know. So it's like they'd done so well to sort of just grind it out and then get ahead. And then to equal, to, to, to let a goal in so pretty much from kickoff was a real sort of kick in the teeth, really. And that was the game they kind of needed to win because they knew that sort of going on the road, uh, to Montreal and the, the following game was was always going to be tough. So um, I think that was a key sort of disappointment out of that game. They just couldn't couldn't see it off, and they, they you know they defended pretty well. And uh, you know Gonzalez Perez was using the ball well, and um, you know Federico Higuain came on at the end of that. So I just wondered now moving forward whether he could be used to you know to add a bit of you know that creativity, especially with his brother not not there. So um, yeah, that was a disappointing performance, and then it, it followed up the following match. Yeah, so, so 
My, so my question to you is this after those two games, because obviously in both games they give up late goals, right? A late tying goal against Atlanta United, and then they give up a late winner to Maximiliano Oruti uh, in, the lo- in the loss to the impact at Red Bull Arena. So for you, do you what, what do you point the issues at, at in these two games? What, what is it defensive? Is it not scoring? What what I have my opinion, and I'll share it after after I hear yours. What what do you think the issues were in these in these last two games? Yeah, they just don't. Look, they just they. I think they've definitely improved the the back four. They look solid, even though you know obviously Lewis Robles is not there. McCarthy's coming and done done fine. Uh, the defense has been good. They just haven't really been able to you know create enough chances to sort of put games games to bed. You know, but I guess that was more evident in the in the Montreal game where they just didn't do it with. With the Atlanta match, it was just they just seemed to shut off and you know um, and just let them straight back in, whereas they could hold firm for five or six minutes and they probably they probably would have been alright and grounded out. You know, it's not saying they were spellbindingly brilliant and, and destroying Atlanta. They weren't. You know, I thought you know Stephen Glass, the Atlanta coach, came out yesterday after the match and said you know that was the real Atlanta the second half. But I didn't even think they really didn't offer anything at all. They barely had really much much of a you know didn't have many shots or anything like that so it wasn't as if Miami were really under the pump but then they scored and they let them in straight away with pretty much their first shot so um, that was disappointing so for me I'm gonna it's something I've harped on all season or, or much of this season and it's that and I asked Diego Alonso this question after after the loss of the impact because their questions were coming up about the defense and, and giving up late goals which yes those are issues that need to be corrected Okay, I, I agree with that. However, you gave up three goals in two games, and you scored two goals in two games. So, to me, the defense is not necessarily doing a terrible job. Is it doing an a incredible job? No, especially when you give up goals so, so in such late stages of a match. But the attack is not generating enough goals. They have 19 goals in 19 matches. Gonzalo Higuain's one goal comes off of a free kick in six games. He's not, he hasn't scored from the run of play. This team just has attacking issues and attacking problems. And one of the issues that I think is recurring and that we saw in these two games is that they essentially attack down only one side, which is the right side through Lewis Morgan and his ability to take people on on the dribble and whipping crosses and, and provide service from the outside there towards the middle. Clearly, he uh, sets up the... The Lewis, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the Brett Shea goal that put Inter Miami up one to zero in that Atlanta United game, and he doesn't set up the Brett Shea goal, but Landro Gonzalez Pires does with a nice ball. But again, that's the center back. So they essentially don't get enough from the left side of the field. Does Ben Sweat occasionally overlap and hit in good balls? Occasionally, yes, but they don't get enough out of their left midfielder, their left winger. Whatever, however you want to describe the position, they don't get enough out of there. And they don't get enough out of there, be it Juan Agudelo, be it Breck Shea, be it Matias Pellegrini, be it even Rodolfo Pizarro. They just don't get enough from that position. And Diego Alonso has, it's clear watching this team, if you've watched this team over the course of the season, and, and I asked him this, and he, because I think it's the first time he's actually said it publicly, he likes width, he likes crosses. And he said he thinks the only way to open up spaces or the best way to open up spaces in the middle is to start doing it by playing in wide positions. I don't necessarily agree that that's the best way. You've got, or to, have the, the, you've got to have the players, though, haven't you? That's the problem. Correct. Have correct. Players to implement that. So have correct. they got the players to fill, fill that system right now? Probably not. It's lopsided. Like you say, right. it's Lewis Morgan down the right, but who's in the middle? And then if Iguain is dropping deeper, then, you know, they he's providing but then there's no no one else up there so and that's and that's and that's a problem because if you want if and again I, I watch every game twice you know obviously the first time you watch it it's everything's new to the eyes and you're you know us on the media side we're juggling tweeting or taking down notes and you're you know, such a pro franco you're no, such a pro. <laughs> but i always go back and watch the games a second time uh, on dvr to see things that maybe i didn't see the first time and Iguain is dropping back a lot to come find the ball, to come get involved, to come pick it up because he's not getting enough touches in in the final in the final third, especially not in in the penalty area, and that robs Inter Miami of a point of reference in the box. So that's not helping their cause. They don't have their number nine is essentially not serving or not playing as a number nine because he feels like he he has to drop back to yeah, try, to try to get you know, the ball. Also- 
he's also their best player, isn't he? So, you know, he's trying to, he has to try and sort of fulfill a number of roles. You know, who's to say that he wouldn't eventually over time, maybe he'll be drawn back into sort of midfield or sort of just like a sort of number 10 or sort of something, something like that. Seen that with Wayne Rooney um, in, in the past where he kept dropping deeper. Michael Owen way back in the day, he dropped, kept dropping back deeper. So uh, just, it's all about if they can get players around him. But right now he's their best, best player, but it causes the team problems elsewhere, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and look, again, I think to me this just goes back to the function of the team and, and the lopsided nature. That's I think that's the best and perfect word that you can use it because in Spanish I know the word. In English I, I didn't know what the correct word was for the, for them only being able to play down the right side. And it's lopsided. That That is the key word, the perfect word because they don't get enough out of the, out of the left side from the run of play. Now people can point to... Breck Shea's goals, and he has scored goals. But we're talking about from the run of play, what do they generate down that left side? And they don't generate much, if anything, down that left side. So Rodolfo Pizarro will be back in the mix fairly soon. If it's not this weekend, it'll be in the next game. I expect it will be this weekend. And he'll provide an uptick. But again, it's, he even he hasn't been that, that, that player because... He's not that type of player that's going to take people on on the dribble in an aggressive manner, going you know giving you verticality and then whipping in crosses. He's more of a guy that likes to you know dribble on the ball, but then try to combine in short spaces. So I think that's something he'll improve them. He'll improve he, them. Well, you know he hasn't been in great form, but I think he'll he'll improve them regardless. So you know that that is one positive for sure if he's going to come back. But yeah, but the, this goes to the personnel. Like and this is I don't know man the team. I don't know if there's solutions to this. I don't know if there are solutions to this because at this point you're 19 games into the season. There's four games left. Like, how are you going to make that left side all of a sudden generate chances to help you balance out your attack? You're essentially playing down one side. It's not. It's not even. It's it, it's imbalanced. So, well, it's, you play need you new players, but then that's not going to happen right now, is right. it? So, you have so to start I, deal with what he's got. Right, which is why I'm like I, I don't know, man. I don't know if like if I see them, and I'm going to be negative here. I guess I'm going to sound negative. But I don't know if I see them making the playoffs because. It's just not what they're doing has not worked, and it's not working. And it's and but the plan's not changing. You know, Diego Alonso's not necessarily changing his game plan to fit the players he has. He's trying to force the players he has into his desired game plan, into his desired viewpoint or, or style of play. And I don't think it's working. And I don't know if all of a sudden it's going to click. Now they're only two points off, so a win or two can essentially put them into the playoffs and and help them get one of those final seeds. So it is possible, you know, but I don't know, I, man. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you look at the team and you think there is definitely possibilities there for them to do some good things. You, we have seen good things, you know, in the, over the past few weeks. Just it hasn't been consistent enough, and um, you know, the, and the results have sort of suffered because of that. But there, is, there are signs there that things are starting to come together. They just can't maintain it over a two or three match sort of stretch, you know. And I think that's probably going to cost them in the end if they're going to have to go on a two or three game run right now to do it and it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be tough yeah i mean i i, th- I think so i think so do you, like all right we're obviously four games away from the end of the season or for, from inter miami's end of the season i'm gonna put you on the spot do you think they make the playoffs i think they're gonna sneak in you think yeah. they'll sneak in okay yeah i'm gonna gonzalo is gonna, gonna have a little rest and he's gonna come back and that's going to be it. He's going to uh, he's going to save them. I'm going to s- <laughs> I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I, they have a tough matchup this weekend against Orlando. They don't have Iguain for that one. They've got Toronto FC on the schedule still. A, a tough team that's at the top of the Eastern Conference. FC Cincinnati is not not necessarily the the juggernaut that that the other two teams are or that that you know that are near the top of the table so i think that's oh that's a winnable game but yeah i don't know if, if one win and i don't know if two wins will will get it done i i think i don't think they're going to get it done man I, I think they they dug themselves in too big of a hole and i don't see the team um functioning or, or working well enough to to get themselves out of out of this hole i mean but maybe i maybe i'm wrong yeah. maybe i'm wrong you know they they also have fc dallas potentially winnable but it's on the road so a bit of a tougher challenge I, I don't know I don't see it I don't see it I can see three three to four points I don't even I don't know if six will even be enough but well I guess we'll we'll see yeah I mean you know you look at the, the teams that have already qualified you know Orlando 32 points eight wins and Columbus 10 Philadelphia 11 Toronto 12 you know Inter Miami only in five games minus 10 goal difference as well they're four points off Montreal who are in ninth yeah, they need to win on Saturday, basically. 
and then, and then we'll see where they are after that. But yeah, it's going to be a challenge, but they can still do it. And that, that's the thing. So that's just why we love it. Yeah, de- destiny is, is somewhat still in their hands. So uh, we'll, we're going to take a, another quick break and then we'll head into our final segment with our Q&A and final thoughts after this. Eh, pues conmigo era eh, esperar si, si me iban a operar o no, o sea, porque fue una fractura, entonces eh, pasó una semana y era mejor tomar la decisión de, de operarme porque no, o sea, yo no me sentía mejor, la mejoría, pues. okay. ya con la, la operación pues el hueso se me arreglaría y el dolor y, y la hinchazón y todo eso eh, pasaría okay. y bueno entonces tomamos la decisión de, eh, de operarme y bueno eso fue all right Steve it's Q and A time so I'm gonna go through them as I normally do and you will respond and then I will add anything that I think needs to be added to the to the response apologize for the redundancy there but okay the first one comes from an avid listener someone's been following our work quite a bit as of late it definitely seems like he's a, a diehard fan or she's a diehard fan because they're they're following very closely i see them very active on on twitter and social media so it's from at dale rosado underscore do you think mccarthy has a shot at the starting spot next season do you think diego alonso wants to add any more pieces to the team or we just need the players we have to gel more. Also, is Pizarro available for tomorrow? So Eric used to laugh at the fact that we say, do you have a question? Fire away. And, you know, the, the our listeners fire away quite a few questions. So there's a lot there to dissect. Um, Steve, if you need me to, you know, remind you or break them down for you, you know, just just give me a shout here. But, um, you know, what, what are your responses to, to Dalit Rosal's questions? Well, yeah, McCarthy, yeah, as we said, you know, recent, you know, in this pod, that um, you know, the defense has been good. It hasn't really been affected. We thought when Robles was injured, you know, it may sort of screw things up a bit. He was the leader, the captain, all that sort of stuff. And McCarthy's done pretty well. I think Lewis Robles did an interview with the Miami Herald, didn't he, last week or so? Where he said, as you mentioned, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, he doesn't know where his future lies and whatever. He see what happens. So um, he definitely likes living in Florida for sure, I think. But um, who knows? So I think. McCarthy looks looks decent. It just depends on you know the defense in, in front of him, uh, how well they can sort of continue to gel and, and um, you know play together. So, uh, but as we also just mentioned before, they definitely need new players. So, let's see what happens with this season. And I think they want to you know get into the, into the close season and start you know with the transfer market to uh, start working that to see what else they can bring in, no, knowing that they've had a season where they know exactly where they probably need to strengthen and, and maybe, you know, sort out different positions. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see that the moves they make in the transfer market for sure. Yeah, so I think McCarthy has, will have an ample opportunity or will have ample opportunity during these final four games to add to his case or to weaken his case if, it, if things go the other way. I think you saw the first real strike against him in this recent defeat to the Montreal Impact. The first goal I put largely on him. I don't think it's only his fault because the, the midfield was a little weak in, in preventing that run from Bojan, but the strike takes a balance and, and, and kind of surprises him and, and finds the back of the net. It's a goal that he has, or it's a shot he has to save. He can't let that go in. So if he can cut that out and, and continue to play the way he's played mostly in these other games, then I think he's got a good shot to be the number one or at least to, to supersede or, or pass Luis Robles on the depth chart. Maybe Interimis can still go out into the into the market in the winter and find maybe a goalkeeper that's more to Diego Alonso's liking. That's certainly an option, but I think McCarthy will have ample opportunity to impress. And we've touched on you know whether we think the team needs to have more time to gel or whether they need new players. I think they need new players based on what Diego Alonso wants and based on the players on this roster, not necessarily not all fitting how he wants to play and what he wants to do. I think something that's, that is worth keeping an eye on, and this is maybe for a few weeks from now, and we'll, and we'll definitely will talk about it because I think it's a fascinating topic, is what Inter-Miami does with the MLS expansion draft and who they protect obviously the rules haven't been released for this year's expansion draft but in years past it's been you can protect up to 11 or 12 players 
And homegrown players, I think, are not eligible to be selected if they're under a certain amount of years in their contract, some, something of that of that nature. But Austin, the team from Austin, the expansion team from Austin that will enter MLS next season will be able to, if they choose to, pick up one player from Inter Miami. I, I, again, based off of rules of years past. So it's going to be interesting to see who they protect and who they leave available because that will tell you where things stand where who they rate and who they don't rate that's going to tell us a lot a lot um so we'll go to the next question comes from at gabe p 25 75 98 36 should we get a usl championship team so the kids can play at a higher level also having so many problems on the left side why don't we give a chance to number three of fort lauderdale's team he's playing amazingly do you think the new reserve league would do better than the usl championship league have you been following? He kept going. It's the second tweet. Have you been following Fort Lauderdale CF games lately? Which player do you see ready to start playing in Inter Miami next year? I think there should be at least three or four. Also, if we can use them, can we transfer the players we have for one for first round picks at the Super Draft? Play the kids. So quite a lot there. I won't ask you. I won't be cruel to you, Steve, and ask you to to, to answer all of those. I mean, you can pick one and 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 go from there. Like I, I, I'll actually I'll start here because. There's a lot there, and I'm sure your, your mind kind of was all over the place there. Um, no offense to Gabe. Uh, but look, I, I haven't watched as much of Fort Lauderdale CF as I've liked. Obviously, with the MLS schedule being as hectic as it is, it's, it's tough to, to find the time to watch Fort Lauderdale play. I don't think, and I think this is a little bit of you know quarterback syndrome, as they call it, in, in, in American football. I think it's a case of the, the team not playing well and you automatically assuming or people automatically thinking that that somebody behind them or on the bench can, or on the, in this case, USL team is going to give them more. They're, they're, they're getting their teeth cut. They're, they're working their way and learning their game at the USL level. They might be playing well there, but until they truly stand out, stand out, stand out on a consistent basis, I don't think you, you can bring them up to play in MLS, which is a different level, a much higher level. Look, even the young guys at the end of the, the MLS roster, like George Acosta, David Norman Jr. And then, so Ulises have not played and I know they've they've all suffered they've all gone through injuries at certain points this year but even they haven't seen a, a minute's worth of action so I don't think you're going to see much from from the USL team maybe next year someone gets signed from there maybe the best performer will get you know signed to a contract to to, to cut his teeth further with with Inter Miami on a training field but I don't see anyone coming in and making an impact from from that group um Steve what, what are your thoughts yeah I mean you know you're just talking about playing playing the kids and um you know the players have been given a chance isn't it it's just all about what's happened with the the, the bigger signings you know the the Pizarro's Pellegrini you know have they really worked sort of this season you know I don't think they've had a problem filling you know key parts of the team where they need to be sort of workman like and you know play, play as a good unit I think they've, they've done that well it's just it's the signings that have been made you know for the for the big money just haven't really seemed to work so it'd be interesting to see what, how what their transfer strategy is you know, sort of moving forward into the sort of close season, what they're, how they're going to do and they're going to reshape. Because again, we, we keep talking about it, but, you know, when Diego Alonso was appointed, appointed, most of the players were already there. So, you know, he's going to have to put his stamp on this this transfer market for sure. Yeah, yeah. And look, and, and I'll add this really quickly. You say play the kids. Inter Miami is playing some kids. Matias Pellegrini has seen plenty of the field this year and he's 19, 20 years old. Andres Reyes is 21 years old, so they have been playing young players. Now, if they're not giving you the results you know you would like to see, fully understand the criticism, but they, it's not like they're playing a veteran, an all-veteran team out there. They do have some young players that they're trusting in and giving opportunities to. Now, the last question for, for this week comes from a, a friend of mine, a, a personal friend that I know actually had. He, he lives in, in D.C. He actually came to to South Florida a couple of weeks ago when we had lunch. Uh, he's a Peruvian national team fan, and that's how we, we got we met. Um, but he's, he follows our work, and he says, how short of a leash does Diego Alonso have going into next season? Shouldn't he get a full season with this roster? I guess he means another, our regular full season, not COVID time. So I guess that's the question from, from my, my friend at BNCO. His name's Rob. Um, Steve, what do you, what do you think? Look, I think to not get into the playoffs if it's a 14-team division and they can't get in the top 10, I think it's definitely a failure 
without a doubt. But I do think the mitigating circumstances of, as we've just mentioned, him coming arriving at the at the club with most of the, the roster already there, and then all the COVID stuff, and then the, you know they start in Orlando, uh, the MLS is back, all that sort of thing. You know, I just I don't think it it hasn't helped them at all. So I you know I'd like to see him in control, having it like a proper sort of pre-season or whatever and, and and like you say just make his moves in the transfer market his moves and then see what happens and then this time next season if they're still struggling then you know whatever but I think he deserves a chance to, to have a go at it properly on, on his terms you know I think they will give him another season of course I don't think the leash is short at all right now but I do think it's shorter than it was maybe a few months ago I it's think, hard I, man I, it's a hard job I think in this climate I think it's, it's definitely hard I, everything that's gone on I think it's super difficult I, again I don't think he's going to get let go this this off season but I think the leash is shorter than it was a few months ago it doesn't mean that it's that it's super short it could still be long it's just shorter than it was a few months ago because yeah. he's again like I said I, I just analyzing the game and you know Paul McDonough I'm sure even though he hasn't spoken to us in the media for for uh, for a few months now I think he also sees that maybe Diego Alonso isn't getting the best out of the player so that's a strike again it's been a complicated season and they've invested time into building a roster that he likes and building uh, and, and investing in him as well right so I think they will give him another season and I would say if next year is more normal let's say and he struggles during the first half of the season and we see the same issues or a lot of the similar issues or a lot of issues i think by next summer they could they that could be the earliest we could see them part ways with him because i don't think they're gonna give him a complete second season even if it's a more regular season if the signs are still pointing towards a negative direction so i think he'll he'll definitely get a second season uh, we'll see. I think just how how quickly he gets going in that second season will determine his his fate and his future. So that that does it for the Q and A time. Uh, Steve, any final thoughts before we wrap up this week's show? No, I'm just like you know pl- we're pleased for the fans. You know we're both neutrals, but you know what it's like to follow your team and go to a stadium and and, and enjoy all the stuff that match, match day that's been taken away from fans. So especially with. But with these fans, they've not actually properly been to a game before, you know, it's sort of, anyway, so just want everyone to, to enjoy that because I think it's going to be a good occasion for the people who can go and then hopefully moving forward, we can get the stadium full because we've never had the stadium full again, which is such a shame because, you know, the, the amount of work they put in to get the stadium ready the first time. So yeah, enjoy yourselves. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll finally be able to see fans in the stands, at least, you know, a good amount of them. I'm planning to, to head to Inter-Miami CF Stadium pretty early for this one earlier than usual just to hang around outside the stadium maybe catch some footage and and talk to some of the fans and the supporters and and maybe get to know them a little bit and and see how they've how they've been dealing with this whole complex season because again you know the diehards are going to be there and the diehards have been there they they drove to orlando at one point to watch them play and the supporters groups were there and they, they were at the most recent home game so supporters those supporters we know bleed black and pink and white um but but the other supporters maybe that are that are not in the supporters groups that have season tickets that want to see the team that have essentially been able to have been forced to watch their local team only from afar i'm curious to see how how excited they are and how they feel and what they think about the team in their current standing so i'll definitely be there steve you know if you want to head out early maybe we can introduce ourselves as the miami total football radio duo i think you know maybe 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 people will take a liking to us or maybe they'll just absolutely hate us and never listen to our we'll podcast be wearing, again like, pink, we're wearing like pink suits we're just like black hats <laughs> holding a billboard up <laughs> I mean, don't be scared. We're, I, we're fine. I actually bought a pink suit uh, last year from from Express, so I do have a pink suit. I know you joke. And maybe you we should end the say, pod now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, maybe I'll wear it. Maybe it's not a bad idea. No, no, no. One one of the rules I have for myself, just personal rule, is never wear uh, either either team's colors when you're covering a game, home or away. So um, surely it should be. I'll never wear a pink suit. Surely that <laughs> should be. <laughs> it's not that rule's not on there. That rule's not on there. But maybe you know, I'll wear it at some point and see what the reaction is and then you know if it's not if it's not great then maybe I'll uh, I'll retire that um but just one thing though about, sure. about the stadium also you know logistically for all the staff and you know they've, n- they've not had fans in there before so and they have to monitor the social distancing and mask and all that sort of stuff so you know there's a lot going on behind the scenes as well to try and make it happen so 
you know, hopefully it will, it will, everything will be okay. Right, yeah, this is, I guess that's worth noting, and I'm not going to tell anyone how to behave or what to do, because that's just not, that's not my, my, my thing, but Inter Miami is taking this, and they announced this, as part of their announcement, they said this, they're taking these games and opening these games on a week-by-week basis or game-by-game basis. Now, Inter Miami only has another home game after this one, so there's one left, but if you guys, as you, and you know, you fans, you supporters, want to have a chance of attending another game, then you guys probably should be on your best behavior in terms of following the guidelines and rules. Because if you don't, then there's a chance that they decide not to open up again in, at the next and final home game of the regular season. Just something to take into account. Again, enjoy the match. It's, you you guys deserve it. It's been such a tough year personally and uh and professionally for 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 a lot of people so enjoy this one have a great time and root your team on for a hopeful win that will help push them towards the playoffs but all right steve that does it for this week again everyone please give us a follow on our social media channels that i mentioned at the start of the show please give us a fee give us feedback on Apple Podcast, a review and feedback, comment on Steve's English accent if you'd like and how much better it has made the show. Uh, and anything you want, anything you want. We appreciate any and all feedback, good, positive, negative, constructive. We take it all. So that does it for now. We'll be back next week to talk about Inter Miami's first game in front of fans. Until next week, big soccer heads.